Well, good morning. Welcome to Faith Harvest Church. We are glad you are with us. Thank you for those who are tuning in online. We're going to get started. Today is Pentecost. So again, we're going to just dive in today. Amen. Um, you know, I was thinking about it this morning, um, just listening to some different just things that have been prayed out in the past years. And, um, you know, I was just thinking about the fire of God and how many times sometimes do we get to a place to where you don't feel as on fire as you once did before and you may wonder where to go well i was as i was thinking about that I just it hit me it was just like it's already it's in you it doesn't go away if you have the holy spirit in you you got the fire of god in you now it may be an ember that needs to be stirred up to a flame but the foundation is still there and if you know anything about fire, in order for a fire to be able to get to a greater and greater flame, there has to be wind. And that's what you saw on the day of Pentecost. You saw there was a flame and there was a wind and it began just to blow. And, and as I was just meditating on this, I began to realize that a lot of times why we don't step into a greater fire is because something's restricting the wind. The wind of the spirit to be able to blow upon things and and anytime we get into a place of apathy or complacency and sometimes as you know the fire we want it to burn but there's things that come along you know we've talked about it before anytime there's anger and offense and jealousy and competition and comparison and strife i mean those things that doesn't kill the fire it blocks the wind so now that the fire can't grow and so we have to allow, if we want the wind to blow, we got to get those blockages out the way. And I felt this in prayer this morning. You know, if, if you feel like your fire's dwindled, but it doesn't matter what level your fire's at, today's the day to go to the next place. Today's the day to get it burned hotter. If you're red hot, you can get even hotter. I mean, what did Nebuchadnezzar burn the furnace seven times hotter than normal? It can get hotter. And today, we could just have normal church, and we could go, and you, if there's things that you're dealing with in life, you could go, and you could take weeks and months to get things dealt with and get things ironed out in your life. And you could choose that route. But there's promises today yes. that if yes. we would just lift our hands and just plug in, yes. you wouldn't need those months of walking things out you'd get an instant breakthrough that's how the holy ghost works he, you abandon yourself completely and he comes in and he just takes whatever strongholds in the way he just obliterates it and then you sense the freedom can anybody use some freedom today i'm telling you i think we could all use more freedom i want to be more free than i'm free right now and i'm free so let's stand to your feet let's just call upon the the name of the lord jesus Glory to God. Well, Holy Ghost, you want to do some things today. And Lord, I don't know about anybody else under the sound of my voice, but Lord, I position myself today to receive what you want to drop, to receive what you want to impart, to receive what you want to pour out. And Lord, I know there are others in this room, Lord, who are doing the same thing right now, who are just consecrating ourselves, who are just setting up ourselves right now, Holy Spirit, for you to do what you want to do, Lord God. And so, Holy Spirit, we're praying today you said on the day of Pentecost that Jesus spoke said that you would pour out your power upon them and they would become witnesses Lord and so Lord we're just praying today that Holy Spirit that you would blow upon the embers that you would blow upon the altars that you would blow upon the fire Lord God and that it would just begin to increase in the lives of your people today Lord there are things father that you want to do suddenly and instantaneous today Holy Spirit you don't want to hold back today. You don't want to prolong things today. You don't want to go around the, the wisdom of man. You want to 
burst in with the wisdom of God today. And so, Holy Spirit, we surrender to your blueprint. We surrender to your voice. We surrender to your wind today. Oh, Lord, let us not leave the same as when we walked in today. Lord, let us be walking out, holding the promises that we've sought you for. Lord, let us be walking out, holding, Father God, the manifestations that we've been seeking for. Lord, we thank you that there's freedom in your house today. And so, Holy Spirit, we just pray that you would let freedom flow in this place today. A freedom to worship, a freedom to praise, a freedom to dance, a freedom to let go of the strongholds and the weights and the sins that have so easily entangled many. Lord, we just want to be a pure witness. We want to be a burning, bright witness. You said, Lord, in your word that the righteous days, they get brighter and brighter and brighter until the day of the Lord. And so, Lord, today we want to get a little bit brighter. Lord, today we want to get a little bit stronger. Lord, today we want to get more loving and more joy and more peace and more patience, Lord. We want to walk in greater faith today. Lord, we want to be burning men and women today, Lord God. So, Lord, we know today is a special day in the realm of the Spirit. And so, Lord, we use our faith this morning that we will latch on. Holy Ghost, if it's a shout, we'll shout. If it's a dance, we'll dance. If it's a run, we'll run. Lord, if it's an altar call, it's an altar call. Holy Spirit, we just lay aside our plans and we embrace your plan today. Because in your plan, there's freedom. In your plan, there's breakthrough. In your plan, eyes will be opened. In your plan, the lame will walk. In your plan, Lord, the things that have been seemed deadened will awaken And today. And so we thank you for it today, Holy Spirit. Spirit. We lift it up to you, Father, that your plan is being accomplished. We just echo out of our spirit. Lord, we make room for you this morning to have your way, to have your place. We give you all the praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's the life, it's the life, Lord. It's the life to live. Hallelujah. 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 Glory, glory, glory. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Oh, thank you for the Holy Ghost. For the Holy Ghost. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. 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 You know, Jesus, Jesus told the disciples, I have to go away. I have to go away so I can send the comforter. So I can send the one like me to live inside of you. <laughs> and so he came. And what is he to us? He is our standby. He is our strength. Oh, he is everything that we have need of in this earth. He's our joy. Woo, glory. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo, glory to God. 
good. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. You got something? Come on. Glory, glory, glory. I heard back there by the Holy Ghost. Oh, it gets better. It gets better. Oh, get out of your pity. Get out of your grave clothes. Rise up out of your ashes. It gets better. It gets better. It gets sweeter. It gets better. It gets sweeter. Oh, if you only knew. If you only knew the plans he has for you, says the Lord. Plans of good. Plans to prosper you plans to anoint you oh it's sweeter than honey it's better than wine it's the goodness of god in the land of the living it gets better it gets better it gets better you don't have to stay in your grave you can rise up because it gets better you don't have to stay in that pity it gets better you don't have to stay in that offense because it gets better you don't have to stay in that grief because it gets better you don't have to stay in your loneliness because it gets better it's better with him it's better with him it's better with him and it's gonna keep getting better and better and better and better until he comes oh come on lift up some praise Ghost. Thank you, Father, for the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. You may be seated if you can. We're going to move on in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to give you an opportunity to sow into the kingdom of God. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, God is good. If you need an envelope, raise your hand and don't unplug. This is part of loving God this is part of sowing into what is real what is eternal glory be to God hallelujah 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 and I'm telling you that the kingdom of God is being made manifest hallelujah thank you Lord if you don't believe it look what's happening in here today when the world is weeping the world is fearful the world is in a bad way but in the house of God in the house of God that we're kept that in the house of God is the anchor of our soul in the house of God there's still joy amen glory be to God hallelujah thank you brother lift your hands towards your giving father we just thank you for this honorable seed it is an honor you look at it as an honorable seed father God from your people and Lord we just lift it up to you we give you thanks we thank you for the increase of it in the supernaturally yep 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 Yep, yep, supernaturally, supernaturally, supernaturally. Faith will grow. Faith will bring forth what is supernatural in our hour. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus name. Hallelujah. 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 Glory. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. God is good. Amen. All the time. Amen. God is good. You know, I said something that I never ever said before when we were up in the forum back at the what was it, the end of April? Up in uh, South Carolina with Bert. The unction of the Holy Spirit just came on me and I just said something I never said before. And I've thought about it several times since then. But the Lord said that the reason why sometimes the works of darkness seem so quick to move in and how quickly they operate and how they can just be generated so quickly and, 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 and filtrated atmosphere is because Satan will move at whatever inch he can get to move in where God 
sometimes it takes us pressing in. It takes us really working our faith. It takes us really energizing our desires for the things of God, for a manifestation of the Spirit of God. And I, and I was thinking about that while we were in this conference, and I heard the Holy Ghost say this. The reason why sometimes it takes us a little longer and a little bit more effort and a little bit harder for us to press into the things that God has for us is because God will never compromise mm. to bring a place where he can manifest. Right. He will always wait until the atmosphere is right for him to move where Satan will take any opportunity he has. God requires us to be separated for him. Yeah. And I was thinking, wow, what a powerful truth yeah. that it's not that God is so difficult to get to move or manifest or bring a miracle or answer a prayer. It's he has to have the atmosphere right and he will never compromise to meet our compromise. Amen. So, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for today. I really am. I'm thankful for the praise that came in, in the move of the Spirit. And we're praying about some more of these services. Amen. We just dedicate it to just wholly giving ourselves to the Lord. You guys are taught and taught and taught and taught. And we love teaching, don't we? But sometimes, you know, you just got to stop eating at the table and sit down and let it digest. Amen. And then you can get up and run and walk. I remember I used to be in the construction business and I remember there were times when my partner and I were there working together. We just had this desire, you know, we're going to go to a, we're going to go to a buffet today. And we go and we eat at a buffet and guess what? The rest of the afternoon we were wiped out. We couldn't work. <laughs> And we had to let things settle. Amen. And sometimes we get so much feeding and we don't let things settle. And then we try to figure out how in the world can we do this? Well, sometimes we just need to just take a break. Just praise God. Amen. Let things get stirred up on the inside of us and then we get energized. Praise the Lord. Well, thank God today is Pentecost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God of all of the feasts that took place in Israel. Um, well, all of them are just wonderful. God spoke in Leviticus 23 and he called for seven feasts to be instrumented in Israel. And he called those holy convocations. And if you look that word convocation up in the Hebrew, you know what it means? It literally means a rehearsal. It's, it's talking about an assembly where they came together to rehearse what was to come to pass. And all of those seven feasts were redemptive in nature. And when we come over into the New Testament and we see how that they began to get fulfilled in Christ... It made sense why they were a rehearsal, because when the when, when when Christ went to the cross and he was crucified, I mean, they did that. That happened on Passover. Amen. And he was resurrected on first fruits. He was the first fruit. Amen. Of all of those times that they celebrated under the Old Testament, it was a type and shadow of what was to come. And so each one of these feasts represents the fulfillment in Christ. And so he was our Passover, is our Passover. He was unleavened bread. That means that he had no sin in him. When he died and that bread was broken, he said, this is my body broken for you. It was unleavened, broken bread. And he gave himself for us. And then on Resurrection Sunday, he came out of that grave. He's the first fruit. Amen. Amen. Now think about it. If he represented each one of those, then don't you know that there is a fulfillment of something in the day of Pentecost? Yeah. Just like Passover and unleavened bread and first fruit. There's got to be something fulfilled in the day of Pentecost. Yeah. Hallelujah. Because that was another one of the feasts. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Amen. 
But I want to remind you of this. There was also three in the fall. Those four, Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruit, and, and Pentecost, they all happened in the spring. And then there was this long season before the fall, before any more feasts were ever conducted. And those three in the fall were the trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Tabernacles. Well, isn't it, isn't it amazing to you that the Bible talks about the coming of the Lord, that uh, it talks about how that He will come with the trumpet, the blast of a trumpet, the voice of an archangel, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain be caught up together with Him in the clouds, so shall we ever be with the Lord. That that is the trumpet. That's representative of the Feast of Trumpet, the coming of the Lord. And the Day of Atonement was the time when God judged the sins of Israel, and there had to be that perfect lamb that had to be offered actually it was a goat, had to be offered in the Holy of Holies. You remember the priest went in once a year and offered the blood of the goat? And then there was a scapegoat that they laid hands on, put all their sins on that scapegoat, and let it out in the wilderness to be destroyed. Well, that was kind of like Christ going into the wilderness of, of, of you know, paying our price in the heart of the earth. Yeah. Because he was carrying our sin. But his blood went into the Holy of Holies to make an eternal redemption for us. Glory to God. And then tabernacles is when he comes and he makes his home here on this earth. He's going to return and set up his kingdom for a thousand years. That's, that's like the Feast of Tabernacles. He's going to tabernacle among us. Yes. Glory to God. So we have, a, we have this season in between Pentecost and trumpets. In that season that was left there for Israel for such a long time that seemed like a long time between feasts is representative of the church age. We're in this season between Pentecost and trumpets. Hallelujah. The wonderful thing about it is that these are perpetual. They were perpetual in the Old Testament, but they're to be perpetual in our lives. We're to be maintaining an attitude of understanding Christ is our Passover. He is that unleavened bread, praise God. He was broken for us. We do that in remembrance of Him, don't we? When we take communion. And then, you know, the fact that He is the first fruit, praise God, we know we have hope. He that hath this hope purifieth himself even as he is pure, that we are going to be changed and we're going to come up out of that. He's the first fruit. We come after that. Amen. And then Pentecost. Wow, what a wonderful, wonderful celebration it is to know that God sent his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And there's something very significant about that. And that's kind of really where we want to go today, because this is this is so in, in, inspiring to me. I want you to look, if you would, in your Bible to Luke, I mean, to, to Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two. It says here, beginning in verse 1, it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Sam talked about the wind earlier. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, if you know anything about this chapter, you know that Peter got up among the other and he began to declare what this was. He said, this is that. And he talked about Joel's prophecy, how that God was going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. He, meet, he preaches a wonderful message in this passage, but I want you to go down to verse 37. It says, in fact, let's just back up to verse 33. He said, therefore, being at the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. 
For David is not ascended into heaven, but he that saith himself, the Lord saith unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and unto the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In other words, what came on us will come on you. Yeah. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that live up until the apostles die. No, that doesn't want to say, is it? So for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now watch this. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that were gladly that that, that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day, now listen to the phraseology here. Got to catch this. And there, the same day, were added unto them about, everybody say about, about, about 3,000 souls. Now, what is so significant about this whole experience on the day of Pentecost? What is so significant about this Acts 2 experience? Well, if you back up into John chapter 14, Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples moments before he's going to go to the cross. He knows his time has come. He even said in chapter 12, my hour has come. And he knew that it was time. And so he was preparing them in the upper room by giving them things that they needed to know that would come back to their remembrance after his death and his resurrection and ascension. And he tells them, he said, I'm going to pray the Father. He's going to give you another comforter. Yeah. 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 And then he tells them, he says, it's expedient for you that I go away because if I don't go away, the comforter yeah, right. will not come into you. So there was something that he was praying for, for them to get that he called in Acts chapter one, the promise yeah. of the Father that God was wanting to do something. The promise, listen, the promise went all the way back to the Old Testament. Because when you go back into Exodus, I think it's 32. In fact, let's just go back there. How many of y'all came with your shouting clothes on today? Yes. Praise God. If you read this whole passage here in, in Exodus 32... This is when Moses went up on the mount to receive the Ten Commandments. And he's been gone for a while. And the children of Israel just got real antsy about him being gone, thinking, well, we don't know whatever happened to this man. He could have gotten eaten by a beast. We don't know. And so they decide, you know, well, we've got to make some idol that we can represent as God and begin to worship it, you know, like they were going to worship God through an idol. And it evidently, it must have agreed with Aaron because he decided to have everybody take their jewelry and just throw it into the fire and let it become a molted calf. And then they would worship it. Well, Moses is up on the mountain. God told him, said, you got to go back down. You got to straighten all this mess out. They just got themselves in a mess. So, you know, he comes down and he sees it. And, and you know, this, if you read this chapter, you'll know that Aaron, I mean, uh, God had already gotten hot and Moses was asking God's forgiveness for him. But then when Moses comes down, he gets hot. And he gets to the point where he's telling them, basically, you know, you're going to have to decide what are you going to do? You're going to serve God or you're going to serve this idol? And the, the only ones that actually came out of that group were the, were the Levi's, the children of Levi. And, and when God began to address the need to get this thing out of the camp, the sin that had come into the camp, he told the, the Levites, he said, you take your sword on your side and you just take them out. 
Now, here's the, what you need to see. Listen to me very carefully. The word Pentecost it literally just means 50. Penta is the word five, and Pentecost represents 50. So what does this 50 mean? Well, we know, of course, it's in 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus, exactly 50 days. If we were to back up right now to when Easter was, it would be 50 days to today. It was called the Feast of Weeks, Sabiot, which was seven sevens, which is 49 days. And then the next day became that day of complication. What we don't realize many times is that that 50 days when they began to celebrate Sabiot was 50 days after they crossed the Red Sea. So the Red Sea is symbolic of them coming out of Egypt to enter into God's promise which is typified of us coming out of darkness and then into God's glorious light. It's a symbol of salvation. We came out. God, God delivered us by bringing us out that He might bring us in. At the end of 50 days, guess what happens? Moses goes up into the mount to receive the Ten Commandments. He's getting the law. So in the Old Testament... The day of Pentecost, Sabiach, was when the Ten Commandments were given for the law of Moses. And notice this. That's why I asked you if you had your shouting clothes on. Because you remember back on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came in, He was inaugurating a new beginning called the Church Age, which was the new law of the covenant that God was making with us. No longer after the Ten Commandments, the table of stone, but now writing into our hearts His laws and through His Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. And it says here in Exodus 32, I think it is, let's see, yeah. What's this verse? 28, look at 28. It says, And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day. Notice the words here. About 3,000 people. In Acts chapter 2, And there were added unto them about 3,000 people. What God was saying was under the law was death, but under the new covenant is life. In the Old Testament, they fell. Under the New Testament, they were added. Hallelujah. So the significance of that today is that God wants to continue to add to us, not take away from us. The Holy Spirit came to add to us. He came to bring us something. And I've shared this with you all before, but I think it's so important that you get this, is that if you go through the New Testament and study the word power, there's five different Greek words, dunamis, exousia, kratos, Ekus and ex, ex, uh, exergia. And, and this is the, the realm that God wants to take the church. He wants to take us into it. When he said, after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall receive power. You shall receive. Well, that word is dunamis, but you can go through the whole New Testament and find where God wants you to have exousia power. He said, all power, exousia, is given unto me. In heaven and earth. And then he said, you go into all the world. And he gave us the right and the privilege. Ephesians chapter 1 gives us the great prayer. Paul prayed that we would, that we would know the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power when he raised Christ from the dead. Well, that, that actually has about three or four of those words power represented in the Greek right there in that one verse. Meaning that this is now available to the church. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. 
And so when it talks about the Holy Spirit coming, we, we sometimes say, well, the day of Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit came. Well, that's not really true if you really look at it in the truest sense of the word. The Holy Spirit was already here. Yes, Something happened on the day of Pentecost that was different. If you look at John chapter 14, Jesus makes this statement. He said, Now pray the Father that he should give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you. For he dwelleth with you, but shall be in you. So the Holy Spirit was there. I mean, he anointed Jesus to do the works that he did. He manifested himself many times. The disciples saw him operate. Amen. I mean, you know, they had to know when they were passing out that bread and it was multiplying in their hands that the Holy Ghost was in their, oper in their operating in their midst. But Jesus said he hadn't come yet. What did he mean that? He said, if I don't go away, the comforter will not come. He didn't say, if I don't go away, the Holy Ghost won't come because he's already here. He dwells with you. But there was a different operation of the Holy Spirit that was to come that couldn't come until after Jesus went to the cross. Look at John chapter 7. Back up to John chapter 7. Verse 37, in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as, as the scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Look at verse 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive... For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. The Holy Spirit couldn't be given until Jesus was glorified. What does that signify? That he paid the price for our sin. He dealt with the sin issue. When he was raised, we were raised with him. When he was raised... He took his blood into the heavenly holy of holies and offered it on the altar and, and cleansed us of our sins. And now because of the work that Christ accomplished, the Holy Spirit could now come into us in a different way than he operated in the Old Testament and even operated with the disciples in the New Testament or during the time of the Gospels. Amen? Yes. And so we have to understand that there's something significant about the work of the Holy Spirit. There's far more to it than just Him coming. In fact, the Lord said this to me one time. He said, it's not about His presence, it's about His purpose. Because His purpose changed. His purpose changed. He wasn't working from the outside in. He was now working from the inside out. And the Holy Spirit has things that he wanted to do in us that he couldn't because we weren't capable of operating in it. When Jesus said, how be it when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you in all truth. He shall uh, receive of mine. He shall take of what is mine and show it unto you. He, he even said right in before that, he said, there's many things I'd like to say unto you, but you can't bear them now. But when he comes... Then he'll teach you, he'll show you, he'll reveal to you. So the Holy Spirit is a comforter. Yeah. He's a comforter. He comforts our hearts, praise God. But he's a revealer. Yes. He's a teacher. Yes. He wants to show us things to come. Yes. And then he's also the dynamite, yes. the power the that changes us into new people. Yeah. Yes. And restores to us things that were lost in the fall. Amen. Yes. And we have access to all these different realms of power if we would just understand how to make the connection with him. Amen. Yes. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, go with me again back to Acts chapter 2. I think this is part of the most significant thing that we need to talk about today 
And that is, just like I said earlier, that these feasts were to be perpetual. Every year they were to carry these out. And it was to be done every, every year. Every year. Every Passover, they celebrated it. I mean, Israel would come from near and far to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And they did this again with the Feast of of, of first fruits. They did this again with the Feast of Pentecost. And they had nations. If you look at chapter 2, I mean, there was all these different nations that were there that day. And when these disciples came up out of that outer, upper room and into the streets, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost, I mean, all these people heard them speaking in tongues and magnifying God. And they heard them even in their own language. It was like the Holy Ghost was so powerfully manifested that, that all of these nations were hearing what God was saying in their own nation, which is a miracle in itself. It Amen. Yeah. But it tells us here in verse 4, they were all filled. And then, of course, we see what happened. I mean, you look, verse 13, it says that they were began to mock them, saying, what mean is this? And, and, and these men must be drunk with new wine. And Peter said, no, it's just the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. This is what Joel prophesied. And so, you know the story, how all of this transpired. Chapter 3 talks about Peter and John being at the gate, beautiful, and how they were just going to the hour of prayer, and God just did a miracle and raised that man up that had been lame 40 years. And then they got themselves in trouble. You remember how they, they, they told them, you know, no, you're not supposed to preach in that name. You brought all this into our city. And, and they were trying to threaten them not to preach in that name. And then listen to what it says here. Verse 7, chapter 4, verse 7. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power? So there's something operating, wasn't there? There was some power operating. So what power or by what name have you done this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost. Notice that Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, you rulers of people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deeds to this impotent man by whom or by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him did this man stand here before you whole. Hallelujah. And then you know the story, how that they threatened him and told him not to speak in this name anymore. And, of course, Peter spoke up and said, you know, what is it right in the sight of God? Verse 13, uh, 19, to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, for we can not but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And so they had further threatened them. They let them go, finding nothing that it could punish them because of the people and for the men uh, for all men glorified God for what was done. And then it goes, it says, it's how that they returned to their own company, verse 30, 23, and they told all their brethren of what had happened, and they prayed. In verse 29, And now, Lord, behold their threatens, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And listen, And when they had prayed... The place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. Well, it just told us in chapter two on the day of Pentecost, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. In chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 there, it tells us how Peter spoke up and it says, and Peter being filled with the Holy Ghost. So what does this mean in verse 31 that they all were filled with the Holy Ghost? I mean, are we hearing a contradiction that they were filled, but then they needed to be filled? No, it's referring to a refilling. 
It's talking about something that is perpetual. It's something that we're to be getting filled with on a constant basis. In fact, I want to read to you what the Greek actually says here concerning this. Are you all excited about this? Praise God. There's a scripture in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18. It says this. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And if you look at that word be in the Greek, it's actually a present tense. It's not something futuristic. So when it says be filled with the Spirit, it's talking about presently, right now, be filled, right now. And if you go back into the, into the Greek, this is what it literally means. Oh, I love this. <laughs> it's speaking of a conscious continuation. The word be is to be something that is continual. You're to be, and then you're continue to be, and you're continue to be. It's never to have been, and it's never a hope to be. It's a be constantly, continually. Because it's a present tense word. And the Greek describes it as this. The ideal situation of every saint is that they are to be filled continually. Meaning to be being filled or to be kept full. The present tense aspect of the command indicates that we are not to rely on a past filling nor of the expectation of a future filling but a present tense continual filling I grew up in Pentecostal circles some of you may have too we used to have every once in a while we used to have a testimony service. Have you ever been in a church that had testimony services? Well, I can remember sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so jump up out of their chair and give a testimony. I thank God I was saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, and I'm on my way to heaven. And they were no more filled in that moment than I'm a man that's on a mission to the moon. <laughs> because some of them had some very sharp tongues. Some of them had some activity that was ugly. But they testified they had been filled. I've been filled with the Holy Ghost 33 years. I'm thinking... 32 and 364 days of the year, you ain't been filled. You might have got filled one time. But you are far from being filled. Somebody asked Dwight Moody one time, have you experienced the second experience of the Holy Ghost? Thinking, you know, the first is when you get saved. Now the second is getting filled with the Holy Ghost. Have you experienced the second experience of the Holy Ghost? And he started laughing. He said, what? He said, I've had so many experiences, I can't count them all. See, we, 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 we religiously think that once we've gotten tongues and once we've been filled with the Holy Spirit we have arrived and there's a pride about having that experience but see people forget this is a continuation this is not something that you're just supposed to have one time they went back and they were filled again in Acts chapter 4 they got another refilling Amen. And you can go through, I mean, you can go through this. Let's just look at a couple of verses. Look at chapter 7. I mean, well, actually chapter 6. This is when they had to pick out some deacons, right? Now, how many of you know the deacons weren't on the same level of what the apostles were? These were just men that had been given the, the, the appointment to serve in the business of the church. 
Not that one's better than the other. You understand me? But the office, the position, the, uh, the apostle said, we have to give ourselves to the ministry of the word and prayer. And we need to have somebody else oversee this natural business. Well, you know, you'd think, well, if you're going to have natural business, you better get some natural people. But that's not what happened in the early church. They said, you pick out seven men of honest report full of the Holy Ghost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. Full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. And it tells them how that they picked out these seven men and how it was all agreeable on the, uh, by the apostles. They laid their hands on them and set them apart. And then it says this in verse 8, And Stephen, who was one of the seven, full of faith and power, did great miracles, wonders among the people. Glory to God. Now, go over to chapter 7. This is a great sermon that's, that Stephen, this same individual, preached. Powerful message. But it comes on down here in verse, let's see, verse 54. After he had preached, it says, When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, <laughs> looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Praise God, he was full of the Holy Ghost. He got filled. He must have maintained it because he got picked because he was full. Yeah. Now he's preaching and he comes forth with a word and he's still full. This is, the, this is where the church has got to come to, to realize that Pentecost is not an experience of the past, nor is it an experience of the future. It is to be a conscious continuation. Yes. We are to be being filled constantly. Yes. 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 Hallelujah. Go over to chapter 13. This is when Paul and Barnabas had gone out onto their first missionary journey. And there was a deputy, verse 7, of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas, a sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretations, withstood them seeking, seeking to turn away the deputy from the truth. But look at verse 9. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O oh, full of all subtility and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, thou wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. <laughs> Ooh, glory to God. You talk about a manifestation of power. Yeah. How did that come about? Was it because they just had a little weak prayer meeting once a week? No, it was because they were full of the Holy Ghost. And they went out in the power of the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. And then over in chapter 13, the last verse of this chapter after they had tried to go into certain places and they were forbidden because of the resistance. Yeah. It said, verse 51, they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came into Iconium. And verse 52 says, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. See, this is something we're to be continually living as a lifestyle. Every day, full of joy, full of the Holy Ghost. Constantly being renewed, constantly being refreshed in His presence. Hallelujah. Yes, yes, yes. Glory to God. So many of the things that we have, we take for granted. So many of the things we have, we just kind of have it on our shelf and we think, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm supposed to pray in tongues. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm supposed to stir up the joy of the Holy Ghost. When this ought to be a perpetual thing. Every day. Praise God. Every day, just like the, the priests went in every day and trimmed the lamps. Every day they made the fresh bread for the, for the table of showbread. 
Every day they offered new incense. Every day, every day, this ought to be our activity. The Spirit, the Word, and prayer. The Spirit, the Word, and prayer. Hallelujah. Now y'all got real quiet on me, so don't take that as condemnation. Just receive that as instruction. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now let me show you what happens to somebody when they get filled with the Holy Ghost. Are y'all ready for this? I want to try to make this quick. In Acts chapter 20, and you gotta, you got to understand the difference here between being born again and being filled with the Holy Ghost. Because sometimes people just think, well, I got it all when I got saved. Well, if you got it all, then you ought to be overflowing. And if you're not overflowing, you need to go back to the river and get dipped again. But John chapter 20, Jesus shows up on the day of his resurrection in the upper room and tells them, peace be unto you. And when they had so when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus unto them again, peace be unto you. Must not have satisfied them at first. They might have needed a little dose of peace. As the Father has sent me, even so send I you. In other words, there's a, there's a, pers there's a purpose here that I've come to show myself to you. Not just that I'm alive, but that I've got now a mission for you. And so he says unto them, he breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Well, he did exactly what he said he did. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Ghost. Evidently, they must have received it, right? Well, we understand that from John chapter 14 that he said, He dwelleth with you, he shall be in you. This was when the Holy Spirit came to live inside of them. But they hadn't got acquainted with the person yet. They hadn't gotten familiar with the person. So, you know, as many of us are, we, we if we're not familiar with the person, then we just kind of lean to our own understanding. We kind of live our lives the way we think is best for us. And then, you know, if the Holy Ghost says something or quickens us with something, then we pay attention to that. But we're not really looking for him to give us instruction every moment of every day because we just don't really know the person that well. But when you get to know the person, then it's all about him. It's all about him. Amen. But in this case, he breathed on them. They received the Holy Ghost and he showed himself to them. And then even Thomas came in, you know, and you know the whole story, except I put my finger in his side and behold his hands and reach forth my hand and touch him. You know, I'm not going to believe. And of course, Jesus shows up and tells him, he said, you, you, you believe because you see me. Blessed are they that have not seen me and yet believe. Verse 30 says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Now, if you go over to chapter 1 in Acts, it says, For forty days he showed himself after his passion, and he spoke to them of things pertaining to the kingdom. So many of the signs and the things he taught to them occurred after his resurrection. Up right up until the time that he, uh, you know, ascended up to heaven. Now, now you got to follow this. We're talking about 40 days after the resurrection. And during that time period, even though Jesus wasn't there presently with them every moment of every day, and he only appeared on occasion, they realized that he was no longer living with them. He had been crucified. He had raised, but now he's here and then he's gone. And he's not with us, walking with us like he had been. And so there was a sense in them that we all are guilty of. Fall back to our own natural reasoning. Peter had been a fisherman all his life. And now he's thinking, how are we going to make it now that he's gone? For three and a half years, we never had to worry about a thing. 
three and a half years, we never begged bread. For three and a half years, we never had a place to sleep. We never had a place to rest that Jesus didn't already provide for us. But now he's gone. What are we going to do? Well, what would you do? You'd go back to the only thing you knew to do. And so chapter 21 starts off with this. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias or Galilee. And in this wise showed he himself. There were together. Now think about this. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, and the two sons of Zebedee, which were John and James, and two others. Well, there was only 12, and, you know, Judas hung himself. So now there's only 11, and seven of the 11 have decided to do what? Verse 3. Peter said, I go a fishing. I, I, I'm going back. We got to have something to eat, boys. We got to take care of ourselves. He's already gone. We're going to go back to fishing. And they said unto him, we also go with thee. And they went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. Now, you got to catch the storyline. you got to catch the storyline. Yes. And when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, and by the disciples knew, that, uh, knew not that it was Jesus. And then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any bread? Have you any meat? Do you have anything to eat yet? And they answered him, No. And so he says, Cast your net on the right side of the ship. And you'll find. And they cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, which was John, said unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he gird his fisher's coat unto himself, for he had been unclothed of that that coat and did cast himself into the sea boy i'm telling you that man was he was something wasn't he he jumps right into the sea and the other disciples came in a little ship for they were not far from land but as it were 200 cubits dragging the net with fishes and as soon as they were come to land they saw a fire of coals there and those this <coughs> and fish laid on thereon and bread now, where did Jesus get the fish and the bread? I don't see him taking a pole and throwing it out there and catching him a fish. And God had to supernaturally supply that. And Jesus said unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who are you? <laughs> Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth to them and fish likewise. Now, now here's what you got to understand. This reminds me, Sam, of my supernatural turnaround messages many years ago. Because if you remember in Haggai, the prophet Haggai began to prophesy to um, Zerubbabel and Joshua. It's a different Joshua, but Joshua that were governor and uh, overseers over Israel when they had come out of captivity and were rebuilding the temple. And you have to remember, the temple of Solomon was glorious. And it had been destroyed by the Babylonians. And so they were now coming back into their home country after being in exile for 70 years, and they were rebuilding the temple. And those that had been old enough to remember the older temple, when they were seeing what it was looking like as they were trying to get started rebuilding this, that it, it didn't even have any of the glitter and gold that that first that temple had. And so they looked at it and they said it was as nothing. And he said, you know, when you look back at the, the old tense, te uh, temple, it was so glorious. 
And, and, and the prophet said, how do you see it now? Is it like nothing compared to that? Now, this is the word that the Lord gave me that night when I got that message on supernatural turnarounds. Because the verse says that God spoke to both of them. He says, be strong, Zerubbabel. Be so, strong, Joshua. Be str he said, be strong to all the people. He said, because just as I covenanted with you when I brought you out of Egypt, I'm with you today. And I see this same situation happening with Peter. Because if you go back to Luke chapter 5, you see almost the identical situation happen when he first called his apostles to, to walk with him. Peter, James, and John, they were all there mending their nets because they had fished all night and hadn't caught nothing. And Jesus comes up to them and tells them, says, cast your nets out into the deep. And Peter, you know, we've heard this so many times. I've heard this preached so many times. Peter stood up and said, Lord, we've toiled all night and we've caught nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, we will cast out the net. As if he had some great faith that he exercised in the word of God. But if you look at that passage of Scripture real carefully, Jesus didn't say, cast out the net. He said, cast out the nets. <laughs> Jesus knew there was going to be more than they could even contain. Yeah. And that he wanted to prove to them that he was well able to supernaturally supply everything that they had need of. Amen. And he wanted them to be prepared to catch the fullness of that harvest. But Peter, because of being a fisherman, thinking in the natural, you're not a fisherman. You're a carpenter. I'm a fisherman. I know the business. We've told all night and caught nothing. There's no way you're going to get me to take all these nets. We've already cleaned all these, these hours these morning, this morning and, and put them all back in the water. But just to satisfy you. I'm going to let you, we're going to throw out a net. Prove to you there ain't no fish out there. Basically is what Peter's saying. And so the, suddenly, you know, all these fish start coming into this net and it begins to break. And they had other ships to come around and help them get it into the shore. What's the first thing Peter does when he gets to shore? What's the first thing Peter does? He goes to Jesus, bends down, and says, Depart from me, I'm a sinful man. You don't say that when you've just exercised great faith and had a miracle. <laughs> No, he was in disobedience. Amen. And the reason the net broke is because he didn't do what Jesus said. John chapter 20, they've gone back to fishing. They slipped right back into that natural mind. They slipped right back into trusting in the arm of the flesh. And Jesus shows up and he says, you got any fish? You got something to eat, boys? <laughs> Now, when he tells them this time to cast out that he didn't say plural nets. He said, throw your net on the other side of the ship. And of course, when they did, they caught all these fish. And it says, and even the number it gives said, and yet the net did not break. Do you see the parallel of the two stories and how Jesus was trying to show them, if you do what I tell you to do, I'll make sure you get a full supply and you'll not have to suffer any lack as a result of it. And he said, and not only will I provide you with that, but just like I'm sitting here on the shore with a supernatural fish and some supernatural bread that I didn't have to go out into the water to get that God gave, he'll take care of you the same way. And so he begins to eat with them and share with them. And then he looks at Peter and he said, Peter, do you love me more than these? Now, he could have been talking to the other disciples, but I think he probably was talking to him about them fish. He looked over that big old net full of fish. He said, do you love me more than those? 
In other words, are you willing to do what I need you to do instead of you leaning on the arm of the flesh to get what you think you need? And Peter said, you know I love thee. And Jesus asked him again, do you love me? Peter said, you know I love thee. The third time Jesus said, do you love me? It said Peter was grieved because the Lord asked him the third time, do you love me? Well, see, we don't get a whole lot out of that just reading that in the natural. But what Jesus was basically saying the first time, he says, do you agape love me? Do you love me with an unconditional, total sellout, total yieldedness commitment to me? And Peter said, Lord, you know, I phileo you. I, he didn't say I, I agape you. He said, I phileo you. You know what phileo means? I like you if everything in between you and me okay. As long as you and I are on the same page, and as long as you and I get along, you please me, we're in fellowship. But you get out of fellowship with me for whatever reason, you say something I don't like, you offend me, my love just sunk. Because I'm not in this as a commitment. I'm in this because of what pleases me. So Jesus asked him again, he said, do you agape me, Peter? Peter said, Lord, you know I phileo you. Jesus turned around, this was slapping Peter's face. He said, do you phileo me? In other words, do you really count me as your friend? Do you really want us to have fellowship? Do you really want us to be on the same page? Are you really truly committed to me as your friend? And it grieved Peter. Because he said, yeah, you know, I, I, I fillet of you. So he was questioning even his intent to be a friend. And Jesus said, if you do, then do what I tell you to do. And then if you read the story down a little bit further, Jesus gives Peter a little bit of an insight to the future. And he said, there's a, you know, right now you can do what you want to do. But he said, there's a day coming when people are going to have to guide you and lead you and take you where you don't want to go. And it says right there in John chapter 21, it said, this spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, follow me. In other words, sell out. Sell out, Peter. But here's what you got to understand. This is what's so exciting to me. I mean, when I got this, I was sitting there thinking, Woo! man let me just get a little shout going here <laughs> because when Peter realized how he was going to have to die mm -hmm. and Jesus said follow me Peter had to right then make the commitment mm -hmm. if death is my future mm -hmm. and to be able to follow him I'm going to have to follow him all the way to death I might as well decide now I'm a dead man. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I might as well decide right now my life doesn't count. Whatever he wants is what I'm going to do. And so in obedience, thank God for obedience, but he in obedience went and did exactly what Jesus said do. They tarried for 10 days in the upper room. And then, of course, the day of Pentecost arrived and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. You can look at the life of Peter after he's filled with the Holy Ghost and he ain't the same Peter. Something changed in that man where he was bold and assertive and he didn't care what people thought. He was going to just say whatever he knew the Holy Ghost wanted him to say where just days before he had denied the Lord three times. Yes. Now he's speaking up for him. Amen. Hallelujah. So what happens when you get this experience? It, it changes you. You're, you're changed into a new creature when the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you and you got to get to know him as a person yeah. on the inside. To be able to maneuver in life and to be able to know how to adjust your attitude and your behavior and your way of thinking. You got to let the Holy Spirit become your teacher and guide on the inside. That's the comforter working with you. 
But then there's got to be that understanding of that power that comes on you that changes you into another man where you don't care what people think anymore. It's not about your reputation. It's not about what think people think. It's about what God wants. And you get to where you get filled with the Holy Ghost and you run with that in your mind and your attitude. And I'm going to tell you what, you're going to start seeing some miracles. You're going to start seeing some things happen. Can you say amen? Yes. So let's look at this real quick and then we'll close. Ephesians chapter 5 again. Just read it again. He says in verse 18, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. And I, I, I wish I could just take a whole nother 30 minutes and talk about this because this, is, this, this will get your attention. But if you look at this word excess in the Greek, it actually, the root word is soterio, which is the same word we use for salvation. But it's in a negative sense. It's an anti-salvation. He said, don't be drunk with wine where it is excess, meaning don't be drunk with wine wherein you begin to move away from your salvation. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be being filled. Continuous action. And what's going to come of that is several things that you're going to start experiencing in your life. So I, I want to just remind you today, do, do some spiritual inventory and look on the inside and see if these are things that are beginning to, to diminish or are they beginning to flourish? Because that's where you're going to determine whether you're really spirit filled. You say, well, I speak in tongues, brother. I pray in tongues. That don't mean nothing. That don't mean nothing. I believe in speaking in tongues. I believe you ought to do as much as you possibly can. Paul said, I thank my God I speak in tongues more than all of you put together. But there's got to be some relationship with the Holy Spirit to where you begin to experience more of Him. And these are the characteristics you need to be looking for. First of all, joy in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Yeah. If all your joys leaked out, you're just empty and you need to get filled. You say, well, I got filled 25 years ago. Yeah, you got filled 25 years ago, but you're empty as they are long right now. <laughs> there ought to be power. Yes. Power. What do you mean power? When that devil shows up, you just put him on the run. Yes. Somebody calls you and says, brother, sister, I need you to pray. Well, let's pray. Bam. Power of God falls. Boldness, not timidity, not fear. God's not giving you the spirit of fear, but a power Amen. and of love and a sound mind. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. And here's one that we desperately need, and that's freedom. Yes. Yes. Dear God, we need where the spirit of the Lord is. There's liberty. Yes. There's freedom, yes. freedom of expression to God that I love you. Yeah. I'm not all choked up, bound up. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I heard a preacher the other day say, if you're not leaking, you're too bound. <laughs> if you're not leaking, you ought to be leaking. There ought to be some overflow. Amen. Things ought to be leaking out of you. The joy of the Lord ought to be leaking out of you. The praise of God. Yes. Right. Yes. They were filled with joy and the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Speaking to your psalms, yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Y'all be going around singing all the time. Oh, glory to God. I got a song. Amen. Yeah. Even little Faithy knows how to sing. Happy birthday all the time. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to me. <laughs> she, she doesn't mind singing. Yeah. Hallelujah. And then we have services and people are sitting there like this. 
while the song service is going on. Looking around, checking their phone. See, those are indicative of people that need to get filled. They just need a good dose of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. And if you haven't had that experience in a while where you're just overflowing, I mean, that was what that was wonderful this morning. That worship was wonderful. Y'all did a great job. Hallelujah. I could have just stayed in it. In fact, I, Sam was walking up here. He had a little exhortation. I looked at him. I said, keep him praising. <laughs> I walked over to Pastor Betty. I said, keep him praising. <laughs> Why? Because there's a release in that that does something to you. Hallelujah. Praise goes up. Power comes down. Praise goes up. Freedom comes down. Everything you give him, he brings back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Amen. Hallelujah. And the reason he said don't be drunk with wine is excess is because he wants you drunk in the Holy Ghost instead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. All right, stand to your feet. Glory be to Jesus. We're praying. I tell you, just you, you keep us in your prayers about things that we want to see God do around here. I, I could say, I got more I could say. I just, you know, I just got to unplug. But I want to read something that Smith Wigglesworth, how many of y'all heard of Smith Wigglesworth? I, I want you to, I want you to catch this. Man, this is so powerful. He said, we can only apprehend Christ fully by being filled with the Holy Ghost. And then he went on to say this, you cannot be any closer to Jesus than you already are in the Holy Ghost. So when Jesus said, I'm going to pray another comforter, he was basically saying, I'm going to send somebody that's just like me. And I, I want you to admit, Mindy, you're going to love this. Years ago, I was pastoring in middle Georgia. And I, happened, I had an opportunity to go preach for a friend of ours up in South Carolina, up around the Greenville area. And I was studying while we were driving. Betty was actually driving the car. I'm riding in my the front seat and I'm looking through my notebooks and I'm looking at some notes. I had already, I already had a kind of a message. I already knew I was going in, but I'm just studying over it, going over it in my mind. And it was like all of a sudden I saw it. What, what changed the disciples from being fearful, kind of hiding out in the upper room until the day of Pentecost, they break out into the streets and just got bold in their faith. What, what was the difference that brought that? Well, we know it was the infilling of the Holy Spirit. They got baptized in the Holy Spirit. But, but this is what I saw that day while I'm riding up there. And it just absolutely revolutionized my mind. Is the Holy Spirit said on the reason said on the inside of me? He said the reason that that they were so deeply affected is because they knew Jesus on both sides of the cross. Mm. We've only known Him on this side of the cross by His presence in His Word and what we feel. But can you imagine Peter, James, and John? Can you imagine? When they felt the presence of the Holy Spirit in that upper room, and all of a sudden, what they felt was the same thing they'd felt for three and a half years that had walked with them and ate with them and slept with them and ministered among them. And suddenly now it's like the person of Jesus is now in the person of the Holy Spirit. And when they stirred the presence of God up, yes. it was almost like they were saying, we're alone anymore. We're not by ourselves anymore. He's right here. We just got to stir him up. And I'm sure it brought back to their mind that he said, where two or three, or three of you are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And so, you know, when you start sensing the presence of the Holy Spirit, realize who's in your midst. Jesus said he walked up and down in the midst of the golden candlesticks. He's in the presence of us right now. 
He is in the presence of us right now. Man, that ought to put on a, a whole new robe of righteousness. It ought to put on a whole new garment of praise. It ought to be something on the inside of you that says, Lord Jesus, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad, Holy Spirit, you brought the presence of Jesus into my life. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're among us. You're right now ready to do whatever you want to do. Hallelujah. We ought to just give you some praise. Hallelujah. Father, we just want to thank you and praise you for the Holy Ghost. For allowing us to have that presence in our lives. That you're alive and well. That you're alive and well. Hallelujah. Glory to your wonderful name. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. In the Old Testament, when the high priest went in once a year with the blood to offer on the Holy of Holies for the sins of the people, Tradition tells us that they tied a rope around the priest's ankle. And when he went into that holy place, if there was anything that was being offered that was not right, that he would fall dead. And because of the fear of God's presence, no one would go in to get him. So that's the reason for the rope was so they could pull him out because he's a dead man now. We just got to pull him out. And hope to God that we can get this right. So what did they do when they heard the priest operating in the priest in the, his priestly office inside? They listened for the bells yeah. that was on the bottom of his garment. Yeah. Yeah. If you go back and study, the priest had bells and pomegranates all wrapped around the bottom of his garment. And so when he's moving, dingling, 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 dingling. And so on the day of Pentecost, what did they hear? They heard the sound. Yes. The priest. They heard the high priest was in his office yes. and he wasn't dead, but he was alive. Yes. And there was still a sound yes. that was going on. Yes. And they heard that sound. Yes. And when they gave utterance in tongues, I can tell you it was like the, the ringing of the bells. Yes. 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 Hallelujah. Yes. The high priest is well and he's able. He's able today. Praise God. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the day of Pentecost. We thank you for the Holy Ghost. We thank you for the sacred work that you've come to do inside of us. We thank you for the, for the power that you've distributed to your church. That Lord, you said of his fullness have all we received and grace for grace. Lord, we thank you for that fullness. We thank you for the full work of redemption, the fullness of your spirit working in each of us individually and collectively. Lord, just baptize us all new. Renew us in the Holy Ghost. Renew us today. Cause our joy to break out with singing. Cause our, our, our heart, Lord God, to be full and overflowing with thanksgiving and praise and gratitude for a new freedom, a new freedom to walk free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. You paid a great price. Yes. And Lord, we want to honor that today. And thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you that you're working with us and in us. You're among us. That we're not alone. Though it's been 2,000 years, you're still head of the church. The church is still thriving. It's still moving. It's still operating. After so many years of persecution and rejection, Lord, you still got a strong group of people on this earth. And we're so thankful that we're among that, that we are part of the body of Christ. Thank you for that, Lord. Hallelujah. Sam, come up here for just a second. You had something you shared with me early this morning about, about what's going on in earth and heaven. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Just exhort us real quick. Cool. Hallelujah. 
I was uh, listening to the, the Bay Revival, and in the Bay Revival, the minister had a vision, and he saw the saints praying, let righteousness prevail, let righteousness prevail, fervently let righteousness prevail, let righteousness prevail. And he realized in that dream, they were saints who had gone on to glory. And that's their prayer from heaven. Let righteousness prevail. Let righteousness prevail. Let righteousness prevail. And he said, when the pastor of that church heard the prayers of the saints of old, that he broke out into praise and he began to praise and pray the same thing. Let righteousness prevail. Let righteousness prevail. Let righteousness prevail. And he said, when that happened, a crimson wave began to, to be raised up. And he knew it was the, the, the blood of Jesus. But but as I heard it, it may reminded me of the, the wave pastors preached about that. It's this invasion of prayer. It's this wave of prayer. And he said the moment it hit the church, the back of the church, he said the walls of the church blew out. And, and that blood just completely covered that entire place. That there's prayers to be prayed. Yes, yes, yes. And the connection, the connection of what God's doing in our heaven and what he wants done on the earth. It's always been about the connection. It's always been about the connection. And the Bible says that the dispensation of the fullness of time, God's going to gather all things together, both in heaven and in earth that are in Christ, and they're all going to be one. And so we're heading toward a collision between earth and heaven. We're on a collision course for heaven and earth to come together as never before. And the Lord showed me years ago that there's going to be in this collision... There's going to be more manifestations of heaven and earth and more manifestations of earth and heaven. There's going to be more times where we're going to see things. There's going to be more times where things are going to come and reveal themselves to us because we're moving into the end of this. We're moving into the final chapter of what God's done in this whole dispensation called the dispensation of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. We've got to get ready. We've got to get ready. We've got to dive in. We've got to give it all. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 Pray a blessing on a release them. Hallelujah. Glory, glory. Unless they glory, need something. Glory, glory. If y'all need something, get down here if, quick. If you need a filling today, come on, come on, come on. If you need a filling, come on.